First of all, uh, I want to thank the organizers for putting uh, this school together for the second year in a row. Um, I'd imagine it's actually quite a lot of work to put together, but I think it's a great service um, uh, to our community. So thanks for that, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to come here uh, and speak again this year. Um, the things that I'm going to be telling you about um, are, are crystal growth activities uh, that we're carrying out um, in my group um, at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory and Florida State University uh, down in Tallahassee, uh, Florida. Let me get the laser. And I should, of course, acknowledge um, that a lot of our support uh, at the Mag Lab comes from the National Science Foundation as well as the state of Florida. And so what I'm going to do today um, is first of all give you some advice but then go on to um, some discussion of induction furnace methods and then if there's still time at the end um, some arc furnace methods and maybe uh, extend to use some experience um, and tricks that I've learned uh, along the way. Okay so um, also I'd like to give a brief promotion uh, for my group. Uh, these are just some photos of um, current uh, and uh, earlier uh, students and postdocs. Um, at the moment, we have five graduate students and uh, two postdocs, as well as a handful of undergraduates. Um, we also, uh, throughout the year, uh, work with other individuals who come to our lab, um, particularly as part of the Research Experience for Teachers program, which I think everyone's probably, or sorry, Research Experience for Undergraduates, which people are familiar with. I also wanted to sort of mention this Research Experience for Teachers, which, um, for the few advisors in the audience. If you haven't done that, <clears throat> it's really interesting and I think well worth your, your time because you get to work with people who are interested in science but definitely aren't um, experts in the field. So that's a lot of fun. Um, we also uh, do a, a middle school mentorship program where we have local middle schoolers come in and work with us for 10 weeks or so, which is really fantastic. Um, in, in our group, uh, we're interested in a variety of topics, but I think the main ones are kind of bulleted here. Um, we're particularly interested in strong electronic correlations and F-electron materials, um, sort of like what Julia has been telling us about. Um, in this context, we have the opportunity to study things like superconductivity, uh, magnetism, quantum criticality, magnetic frustration, and so on and so forth. Um, probably like more or less everyone in the audience now. Uh, we're also working on topological states of matter. Um, this is really a, um, a major boon, I think, to uh, crystal growers right now because there's this tremendous expansion uh, in terms of thinking of what sorts of materials you know, could host topologically protected states. It's really exciting and it's really a lot of fun. Um, since we're lo located at the Mag Lab, uh, we have the opportunity to look at uh, their fermiology by measuring like quantum oscillations in high magnetic fields. We also like to look at things like large magnetoresistance and uh, non-trivial Berry phase and so on and so forth. And then most recently we've also gotten involved, um, this is really a continuation of, of this type of project, but we've, we've focused in on actinide waste forms. Um, and this is being done as part of a Department of Energy um, Energy Frontiers Research Center. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that work uh, in my talk tomorrow. So in this context, um, we utilize really a wide variety um, of different uh, crystal growth methods. And one of the themes that I want to return to uh, throughout the talk is that different materials sort of have different personalities, right? So you really need to bring the right crystal growth method or tool um, to the particular uh, task that you're trying to solve. So so I think it's very wise to try to develop expertise in, in a variety of methods. Don't just stick to one. Um, and then, of course, once we make the crystals, we want to characterize them. Um, and we do this in a sort of way that people are probably familiar with. We use um, chemical analysis, uh, for instance, EDS, as well as powder uh, and single crystal X-ray diffraction. And then we frequently carry out measurements like electrical transport, um, heat capacity, magnetization, and then we like to tune materials using applied pressures or high magnetic fields. Although I won't focus on that aspect of things uh, today. And also before I really go any further, 
Um, I want to encourage people to interrupt me at any point during this talk. It's not really a formal talk. <laughs> I mean, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. And I don't care if I don't make it to the end. So if there's something that I say that isn't obvious, or if it brings forward a question that you had earlier in the week, please don't be shy to ask, because um, we can talk for 10 minutes about any topic uh, that you want to talk about. So um, I'll just put that out there. All right, so the outline of the talk is going to go something like this. I'm going to start by making some general comments. Um, what this essentially consists of are things that I thought of as I was writing the talk that I wasn't sure how to build into a, a logical structure of a talk, but I still wanted to um, sort of get across to you. Probably these are things that you've heard before, but I don't think it hurts um, to reiterate them. And then I want to share with you some uh, books that I've actually only really become aware of in the past uh, couple years, but that I think are just tremendously helpful. Um, <clears throat> I'll then go on and tell you uh, specifically about induction furnace methods. Um, what, what is induction furnace uh, crystal growth? Uh, what's it good for? And then some specific methods that are easy to implement uh, in a system like this. And at the end, and maybe there will be time, um, I'll also talk about arc furnace techniques. And I think that in your practicals, many of you have already seen arc furnace techniques. Is that right? Has everyone seen arc furnace techniques? OK, I see. I think everyone's nodding their heads. So <laughs> in any case, I won't be showing you anything new, but maybe I can tell you a few more uh, tricks of the trade uh, that you can uh, use to make your, your growths more effective. OK. So some general guidelines uh, for crystal growth. Um, I, I'm sure this has already been said uh, this week, but your starting chemicals um, are of the utmost importance. And so what does this mean? I mean, I think first of all, it's obvious that starting with the highest quality uh, possible starting materials gives you a better chance of having a good quality um, output. Now, that's, that's kind of obvious, right? But in addition to that, I think that as you set out to grow something new, um, maybe it's with some elements that you haven't encountered before, you really ought to do the work of uh, knowing their properties, right? And this means, uh, OK, obviously know if they're poisonous or not, but also maybe find out what happens to them as you heat them up, right? Do they have high vapor pressures? Um, you don't want to be blowing up uh, your ampules, and so on and so forth. You can even think about questions like, do they turn into liquids quickly, or do they become kind of gummy before they melt? All of these things are good to know. Um, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So let me expand on that. <laughs> this is. They're not perfect, and well, you could waste a lot of time trying to use what you think is compound ABC. That is that is so true. Oh, oh, looks like Nick has something to say too. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a resource, or let's say if I'm trying to let's say work with phosphorus? Mm-hmm. What, what I advise is that if there's an element that you've not worked with before, talk to as many people as possible. You know, get on the phone. You can call me. You can call JP or Nick or, don't call me. okay, don't call JP. <laughs> but if, if the people that you're talking to don't know the answer, you can call Julia, right? If they don't know the answer, they're going to know someone that knows the answer. So as students, don't be shy to ask. I mean, I've had many people uh, contact me out of the blue and ask for something I usually don't know the answer, but you know through the process of of talking about it, you can usually figure out uh, what's going on. So I have a comment about that. <laughs> I will return to that. Yes, MSDS is important, but I have I have an additional comment on that. Okay, another thing that I want to say about your starting chemicals. Yeah, don't believe what's on the bottle because the manufacturer might have gotten it wrong. Um, if you're working with legacy chemicals, the ones that have been in your lab for one year or five years or 10 years, maybe the graduate student 10 years ago mislabeled it. So don't believe that. There's, there's one or two other things that I want to say about this. Legacy chemicals are frequently left out in air. Um, that means that they can absorb lots of uh, moisture and other things from air. I've heard horror stories where, for instance, with 
lanthanide oxides, the total mass can be up to 30% of moisture from the air. So if you try to use this as your starting material, this is obviously not going to work, right? You, you want to be aware of that. And then um, uh, for the matter of um, the stated purity, right, on the side of a bottle, um, you may see that it's 99.9% .9 or 4N or whatever. I want to point out that in many cases, um, this rating of purity is only addressing the things that the manufacturer looked for. So in many cases, there's other stuff in there that they didn't look for or didn't know to look for that can completely ruin your growth. So these are all, I mean, it, it sounds really stupid, but you, you want to be very skeptical of your starting material. So do you want to explain what metals bases? Um, yeah, OK. <laughs> I can try. I'm not entirely sure that I know what it means. Yeah. Right. Which means it doesn't count the oxides. Right. Or <laughs> nitrides or whatever. Or carbon. Or carbon. Yeah. So there's so many things that they don't check for. Um, another statement, if you buy some uh, boron, I think it is, even the cleanest boron is going to have a large fraction of carbon in it. And there's a good story about how the rare earth nickel borocarbides were discovered uh, along those lines. Impurities. And iron impurities. Yeah. Oh, do they? Yes. So my point <laughs> at, at, at the bottom, I guess I could have made slides and slides about this, but the point at the bottom is that when you're considering your starting materials, really ask as many questions as you possibly can. Maybe even call the company if, if you care to go to that uh, extent. OK, so that's, that's an important warning. Um, I also want to say, and I'm sure your advisors have already told you this, but write down absolutely everything um, and take pictures. Right? I mean, I know that there's this whole thing about not getting your phone dirty with chemicals, but figure out a way to take some pictures of your process as you go. And the reason for this is that crystal growth always turns on the details. And I can't tell you how many times I've gone into the lab and had a very successful first growth of something, and then on subsequent attempts, I fail completely. Um, and this is because I made some detail uh, that I didn't keep track of. And the only way you're going to be able to track that back and successfully duplicate things is if you keep uh, really good notes. Um, a related uh, statement to this is that it's very useful um, to weigh at every step of the process. This is sort of a good check to know um, if you're losing things. Um, it can also be useful, for instance, when you're doing flux growths, when you separate the flux uh, from the uh, crystals that you produce to know, you know what went where. Uh, in some cases, this may even be enough information to make a guess about the stoichiometry that you've actually produced. It's also useful to know how much of the material you were able to convert uh, into the crystalline form. Or in other words, what was the batch yield? Um, OK, I know there was a, a talk that was entirely on this subject, but I think that it's, it's extremely important uh, to refer uh, to the, chem the binary uh, chemical phase diagrams. Uh, this can help you to avoid some embarrassing situations. Um, keep in mind that these phase diagrams always have um, peaks and valleys. And if you combine two elements in just the right way, you may uh, cause your melt to go above, the melting temperature of your melt to go above what you can access in your furnace. Uh, besides that, um, you want to think about how your melt might react with your crucible. And so here's a nice example um, where I made a mistake. <laughs> This is a tantalum crucible. I really like tantalum crucibles because it's a refractory metal. Um, it doesn't, it, that means you can take it to very high temperatures without it melting. Um, it doesn't tend to react with most elements, so it's also a very clean environment uh, to do reactions in. Um, but I did the experiment unintentionally of what happens when you combine uh, nickel uh, with tantalum. It turns out that there's a deep eutectic in that binary phase diagram. I started heating this up, and the moment that the nickel melted, it immediately consumed the crucible. <laughs> so I was very lucky <laughs> that I was not attempting to react anything that was poisonous or radioactive. We do a lot of radioactive things in my group. Um, but this goes to show you that it, it's very important to do this homework uh, ahead of time. Um, also, when possible, um, it's important to know the properties of your melt, right? I mean, besides the fact, um, does it attack your crucible, 
you would also like to know, does it develop a vapor pressure above it? So, you know, are you going to blow up an ampoule? Does the melt like to climb the walls of the crucible? Sometimes they do. And this information, I think, is particularly hard to get. Um, but I want to bring to your attention uh, one reference that one of my students found, actually only in the past year. This is the Liquid Metals Handbook that was published by Oak Ridge a National Laboratory. You can find it on a Google search, um, but if you, if you can't find it or you, you feel too lazy to do that, um, just email me and I'm happy to send this PDF to everyone. Um, <clears throat> it's actually an excellent uh, resource that tells you the properties of all sorts of uh, what we would think of as standard melts and some even more complicated melts. Um, I have this comment, optimize your crucible material, that sort of calls back to this. And then one thing that I want to say um, that, I, that I just couldn't go without saying, and, and it is obvious, but uh, leave plenty of time at the beginning and the end of the day uh, to start your process and to end your process. Um, there's so many horror stories of uh, things exploding or catching on fire, and people getting hurt, um, that result from people rushing towards the end of the day. And if there's anything that as an advisor that makes me lose sleep, it's the thought that some student has, or, or me even, right? Anyone, anyone can do this, has done something as a result of rushing that's going to you know, lead to injury or the lab burning down or something like that. So um, <clears throat> please be careful for yourselves and take that into consideration. OK, so the references that I want to uh, bring to your attention. Um, <clears throat> I think I already mentioned that it's very important uh, to carefully select the right crystal growth method uh, for your specific material. Um, if you don't have a lot of experience, that might be difficult to do. But this book um, I found to be an extremely useful resource uh, for doing this. Um, this is just one uh, figure from the book where it breaks down uh, different families of crystal growth methods uh, into these sort of subcategories. And within this text, um, it gives very good um, practical and real examples of how to carry out each of these different types of growths. So I think that with this in hand, you can accomplish almost anything um, for different methods. Um, in addition to that, I think we want to you know, try to avoid getting exposed to dangerous chemicals. And this comes back to this question of MSDSs. You, know, you want to talk to people, gather information. But my experience in trying to get this sort of information from uh, health and safety people is that they will say, you know, go, go read the MSDS. And then my experience in running, reading the MSDS is that it makes it sound like everything is probably going to kill you. Uh, so in other words, it doesn't do a good job of, um, of separating, um, I don't know, intensity of risk, something like that. So this book actually um, is a good resource for understanding intensity of risk. And I, I believe there's probably other texts like this, but this one I think is a good one. So, um, OK. So that more or less brings me to the end of this general advice uh, part of the talk. So I want to just briefly pause, give it, people a chance to think of any questions uh, that they might have about these sorts of comments or anything else from during the week. This is a quiet group. OK. You can email me. Yes. <laughs> um, I just, uh, actually, Dave Andrews brought up, there's, there's a new book also. I haven't really looked at it, but there's a Springer book uh, from a Japanese fellow called uh, uh, Beginner's Guide to Crystal Growth. Uh -huh. Crystal Very Crystal nice. Growth OK. So it's, it's <coughs> on the Springer link connection. You can just download it. Oh, that's awesome. OK. Yes? Do you have any stories about uh, maybe doing something the wrong way because you didn't do research in the chosen? Well, not, not in explosions, perhaps, but. Um, well, I can tell a, a story that I've heard. It, it wasn't about me. So Paul Canfield, maybe he already showed this, but Paul Canfield likes to show this video of what happens when you make um, a melt that is very uh, rare earth rich. You know, or lanthanide rich. Um, apparently, these these types. So you may um, you may be tempted if you look at a binary phase diagram of a rare earth and a transition metal when you notice that there are some very deep eutectics, right? And this might be a really great way to make a molten metal flux growth. Um, actually, I have done that 
before I was aware of the risks involved. Um, if, if that growth goes sideways, um, that's a very flammable um, and re air reactive uh, situation. And in the video that he shows, um, he shows a, a little ingot of, I think it's a rare earth transition metal um, catching on fire. And it makes a plume of, of um, I don't know if you would call it exploding material, but rapidly reacting material um, that goes on for quite a long period of time. So that, that's a good example. Um, I think the example of um, putting the wrong materials in the wrong crucible is also a good example. Yeah. Okay, so I guess I'll move on. Um, so now I'm going to focus uh, on, on this uh, different type of uh, crystal growth method um, that I think uh, maybe uh, you guys haven't encountered yet, and I don't think that it was part of the practicals. Okay, so induction furnace methods. Um, this is actually a really wonderful way um, to, to uh, drive reactions. It seems to be a lot less common in research laboratories um, uh, than I would tend to think based on how easy it is. Um, but for some reason, it just doesn't seem to be all that common. So what is an induction furnace? Um, what it really is, um, I'm showing you a picture here of, of the apparatus that we've built up in my lab. Uh, this is a terrible picture, so I'm not going to focus on that. Um, and instead on this schematic, uh, what this really boils down to is that we have an RF uh, generator power supply that's connected to uh, some sort of coil. Um, the coils that we use are um, copper coils uh, that we can bend uh, using a pipe bender. And they're hollow on the inside to allow cooling water to go through it. I mean, that's, that's really the whole story. Now, around this, you can build up all sorts of different things. And what, one of the really wonderful things about it is that um, shaping the coil is really straightforward. And I'll show you how straightforward it is. Um, this means that it's very adaptable into different uh, sample growth environments. I mean, I think the limit is only your imagination. Um, what we have in our system uh, is basically a quartz tube um, through which we can flow uh, any type of gas, but we frequently flow uh, purified argon gas. Um, and then we've uh, attached to this a, a way uh, to suspend a sample in here, uh, in this case uh, by a, a pull rod. So the way that this works is that the um, power supply uh, puts an RF um, electrical uh, signal uh, into the coil. That in turn uh, generates an RF uh, magnetic field on the inside. And so what's good about that is that you can then take a metallic workpiece, like what's shown here, um, insert it into the coil. The magnetic field will couple to the electrons into the, in the workpiece. It'll drive them around in the sample, and you'll get resistive heating. So it's a very effective way um, to heat your sample uh, without touching it, right? There's some advantages uh, to this approach when you compare it to like a, a resistive box furnace or an arc furnace and other sorts of things that you've seen. Um, for one thing, um, you can get very localized heating, and I'll, I will come back to this later. But depending on the, the shape of your coil, you can uh, focus the heat down to a, a pretty small uh, area. You can also, uh, by the same uh, sort of approach, get a very good control over temperature gradients. So you can do things like uh, make your coil very long and spread out your temperature gradient, or very short and make a very sharp temperature gradient. In addition, um, I think this is a big advantage, in some cases, you'll get stirring of the melt. And um, stirring of the melt can be very useful. Um, I remember last year uh, in a talk by Brian Sales, uh, he told us about a certain crystal growth that I think was manganese bismuth. I don't remember exactly. Where it was a flux growth, he was struggling with the growth, getting little tiny crystals. And then at some point, he realized that if he would jiggle the furnace and encourage some stirring, that was the key to making large crystals. I think that um, a similar uh, principle is in play uh, when you're uh, doing crystal growth uh, with an induction furnace. Um, I also want to comment that uh, you can do metals, obviously. You can also work with nonmetals. Um, this is because uh, the sample itself doesn't have to be conducting, just the crucible that it's in. So this gives you um, access to a really wide range of different types of materials. I think I already mentioned this about the operating temperature. It depends on the coil and the power supply. I don't understand how you actually stir the melt. Could you explain that? 
So, yeah, this is a good, a good question. But as far as I understand it, uh, what happens is that the, um, it's through coupling of the magnetic field um, and to the, the sample once it becomes a liquid. And <clears throat> as, as the um, magne magnetic field is you know, oscillating, um, I guess what it boils down to is that the vessel itself is not totally symmetric, and it, it just drives the, um, the melt around. The other thing that I did want to comment on there is that sometimes you can drive it too far, um, and you can put it into a turbulent uh, sort of situation. So I've even seen cases where the melt um, you know, will be moving, but then it'll start hopping you know, uh, up and out of its um, you know, gravity minimum. So that's uh, pretty interesting. Um, oh, and I didn't list this here, but another advantage to this is that if you use a transparent container for your sample, you can actually observe it you know, as the reaction is happening. This is tremendously useful because you can learn where different stages of the reaction are happening. And in principle, you could even bring something like a beam line in here uh, and actually observe uh, through X-ray scattering or neutron scattering, I guess, um, uh, when reactions take place. We haven't gone there yet, but I think clearly there's a potential uh, to do that. And then finally, I already mentioned this, but you do have tremendous control over your environment because you can uh, custom make uh, these coils to more or less any dimensions that you're interested in. And that gives you an ability to control gas environment, vacuum, and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, all that being said, now I want to show you a picture um, of the induction furnace in action. Um, what I'm showing you here um, is a coil that was wound uh, in 2016 by some of our research experience for teachers participants. I think this underscores just how easy this really is. They did this, I don't know, over the course of an afternoon, maybe two afternoons. Uh, what they did is they wound uh, a coil in one direction. Um, if I put a metallic sample in here, um, it'll feel a, a levitating force in this direction. That's not a stable situation, right? So what we did is that we then made a counterwind uh, in the other direction to give a little bit of uh, stabilizing um, magnetic field. Okay, and so show you this video. Yeah. We're loading it using a quartz tube because I didn't want to put my fingers in there. Um, <laughs> that's an aluminum, uh, just a piece of aluminum metal. You see it levitates nicely. Uh, it does rigid body motion right now um, because it's a solid, but as soon as it starts to melt, you see that it settles down. Um, and actually, if this coil were really perfect, you would even see this start to spin. Um, we wait a little bit longer. Actually, one point that's worth making here is that this clearly shows the potential for making crystal growths um, that are crucible-less, right? Crucible is a potential source of impurities. So in the right situation, you could make a growth with no crucible. OK, so now you can see that the system warms um, to very high temperatures in a very short period of time. It's white hot, so it's over 11 or 1200 degrees C. I don't know what the temperature is, but it's, it's hot. <laughs> and it was quick. Um, let me see how much more I have in this video, and it's almost the end. And then, of course, um, you know, if you want to cool it down, you can drop quench it, or you can just turn it off, so on and so forth. So I think this gives a very good um, first demonstration of how the induction furnace works. You also use receptors? Uh, I will get to that. Yes, <laughs> that's an excellent idea. <laughs> um, okay, I, I wanted to illustrate, I've already said it, but I want to illustrate that your imagination is the limit in terms of making different coils. Um, they're totally straightforward to make. Your machine shop can help you if you want to have nice flat plate like ones like this. But in the lab, it's very practical to just uh, wind your own coils. And of course, your limitations um, really are just the coil area and the length, uh, which determine how much power density you can put on and the temperature gradient. And um, you know, of course, your other limitation is the strength of your power supply. But there's all different sorts that are available. So um, OK, so on our system, it's a, um, it's a 6 kilowatt system. And the power that we were probably running at that point was about 100 amps, I think. Yeah. I will get to that. <laughs> OK, good. So you guys know everything already. That's good. OK. Uh -huh. Ah, 
Ah, that's a good question. Um, I want to say yes, but I don't know how to answer that definitively at this point. It's possible. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, we could talk about that more if we, if we can explore it. OK. Um, OK, so an, an important consideration uh, when you're doing induction furnace growth um, is the, the crucible selection, right? So I've shown you that you probably could do crucible list growth. Uh, but in practice, um, you frequently get into a situation where you're just using a crucible because it's convenient, or maybe your sample is too heavy and the levitation uh, isn't strong enough. Um, but for the induction furnace method, you really have um, just a vast number of different uh, possibilities. Of course, this brings you back to thinking about you know, the properties of your starting elements. But I just want to point out uh, some of the different types of crucibles that we've used. Um, we like um, platinum and nickel crucibles. Uh, platinum is very nice because you can take it to reasonably high temperatures, um, even in atmosphere, and it won't oxidize. Of course, it's expensive, so we try to avoid that a lot of the time. Um, also nice are tungsten and molybdenum crucibles. Um, you can get crucibles of this sort made into more or less any shape that you like. So this is a very basic design, but in some cases it might be nicer to have crucibles that have a shape like this. Um, these are prepared, as far as I understand, by um, spark, spark erosion. And so when I get these, I typically order them from a company that does that for me. I think machining these types of uh, metals is very difficult, so don't try to do that. Um, I like graphite crucibles a lot. They couple uh, extremely well uh, to the RF field. You can heat these up to very high temperatures. They can be shaped into more or less any shape that you can imagine. Um, and relative to these types of things, they're extremely cheap. So this is a good type of crucible to use when you're making um, first explorations of different types of crystal growth. Do you buy them like that, or do you? So I buy them like this. <clears throat> I buy them like this. But I believe that if you had the right equipment in your lab, this would be no problem to make. I haven't done that myself, so. Uh, but they, they're cheap to buy like this. You know, a little, um, not a 2 ml, but like a 10 ml. Um, I think I recently bought ones like this that were something like maybe $4 each. So you can buy a large number for a reasonably low price. Um, OK, but you're not limited to metallic crucibles. Uh, you can also use you know, our favorite uh, oxide crucibles as well, like aluminum oxide. Um, of course, aluminum oxide doesn't couple to the RF field, so you have to do something. And what you do is very simple. You just wrap a susceptor uh, around the crucible. Um, I've used things like niobium foil that's very thin. Um, niobium, like thin plate, is really good because you can bend it and get it to sort of uh, grab itself. Uh, but this approach is really very straightforward and opens up other sorts of opportunities for you. And then finally, I just want to point out also that tantalum and niobium uh, crucibles are very um, friendly for this type of technique, um, in part because they're good refractory metals, but also because you can take these tubes and actually seal them using an arc furnace. And if you do that, um, you can put elements in here uh, that, that might not like to stay put, right? So uh, you want to be careful so that you don't make a bomb and blow yourself up. But um, you can put some elements in here that might have a high vapor pressure that at some point can get dissolved into a melt, and then that vapor pressure problem can be taken away. So before proceeding on something like this, uh, educate yourself. <laughs> but this is a way to deal with high vapor pressure elements. OK, and just to return to this point, um, as you do all of this, it's always important you know, to consult your phase diagrams so that you don't do this, and to know your melt. Um, and I, OK, sometimes this is inevitable. This is an example of the, um, the melt uh, crawling out of the crucible uh, over the course of several hours. Um, but if you can avoid this, like for some reason on this growth, we did manage to avoid this problem. That's better than this. OK, so know your melt. That's important. OK, so now, now what do we actually use the induction furnace for? <clears throat> well, uh, first of all, uh, like I said, it's very useful 
uh, for fast melting uh, of elements and also for direct reaction of elements. So here's an example uh, where we start with some nickel balls. Remember that nickel has a fairly high melting temperature. I think it's close to 1500 degrees C. That's higher than you're going to access in a resistive furnace, keep in mind. And it's also, well, in a normal resistive furnace, um, and it's also higher than the melting temperature of, of quartz. So you need something a little bit more powerful uh, to melt something like nickel. In an induction furnace, you can go ahead and take you know, your nickel balls. In this case, we put it inside of an alumina crucible uh, wrapped with a susceptor, um, heated it up um, inside of our uh, system. Not quite sure why we have this pictured uh, sealed inside of a quartz tube, because that's not what we did. Um, and then in the end, you can see uh, the end product, where the nickel was melted quite nicely, um, no problem. And an interesting observation here is just that these little crystallites actually seem to like to form out of the melt. Um, besides this, you can uh, do things like uh, do direct reaction of elements, just like you would do in an arc furnace. Uh, this is um, totally analogous. Um, but I wanted to include this here to make one point and to sort of express a useful trick to you. And that is that if you make a polycrystalline sample, uh, you may feel disappointed because you don't have a single crystal. But there's something you can do. If it has facets on it like this, get your hammer out or whatever your favorite smashing tool is and tap it lightly, okay? Sometimes it'll fall apart and single grain platelets will fall out. Um, if you then take those single grain platelets um, to your Laue diffractometer or single crystal X-ray diffraction you know, and determine that it is a single grain throughout, you now have a nice single crystal that you can use for really a wide variety of different types of measurements and you've avoided all the pain of you know, the more sophisticated methods of creating single crystals. Just one brief story um, with respect to that. Um, for the compound uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2, this I'll talk about more tomorrow. It's a very well known compound. Some of the most important measurements in recent history have been performed on really high purity samples. People have gone to great lengths to produce these really high purity samples. But something that you'll notice is that actually, if you get a polycrystal of that material um, and cleave out a piece, um, it already has a really enormous uh, triple R, or residual resistivity ratio, which is much better than what you get from a typical Chakrowski growth. So I would argue that if people had used their heads you know, early on, uh, they might have been able to learn a lot about what we know now. Did they? But I, that's probably true, because I've now seen samples cleaved out of bulls like this that have really competitive triple R's. Anyways. Yes? So in terms of combination, do you, do you have a way that, that you um, get a, your... Okay, that's a good question. That's a good question. So uh, what, what Nick is referring to is that um, when you're dealing with intermetallics, you always want to think about the atmosphere that you're doing the reaction in. Um, the way that people uh, try to make clean gas atmospheres in a lot of systems is that they have um, another uh, liquid metal somewhere around or a hot metal powder or something like that that's there to remove impurities from the gas that you're flowing. So that's called gettering. Um, the way that we accomplish this in our system is that we have a, um, a gas purifier that's from Centaur. Um, we <clears throat> take argon gas out of the bottle, flow it through the gas purifier, and then pipe that into uh, the quartz tube. What about outgassing from your starting elements? Yes, that's another uh, important point. And actually, it, 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 it can even be worse than that. But um, I don't know. I, I, I don't think there's a simple way to answer that question. But I think it goes back to the, the question of what is the quality of your starting elements. The reason that I ask is because in the art furnace, yeah. you can do this. Yes. Yeah, I, I think you could. I mean, you could individually take each of your elements and just like you do with the arc furnace, melt them each individually and then combine them. That, that's one approach that you could take. Or if you're lucky enough to have an arc furnace, just clean them in the arc furnace and then drop them in the induction furnace. Okay, so, so you can do this type of growth uh, very easily. 
Um, but you can go beyond this. And now um, I want to bring up or return to this question about Chikrowski growth. So I, I don't know. Have you guys encountered Chikrowski growth already? OK, so I see lots of yeses. Uh, in a nutshell, what it is is a situation where you make a molten uh, pool of something. Uh, you insert a pull rod into it and then slowly pull it out. Um, as you slowly pull it out, if you're lucky, you start to form a single crystal. Um, if you haven't actually seen this, um, think of it as something like where you have some solder and you take your soldering iron tip and just sort of pull a, a finger out of it. It's, it's as simple as that. Um, the way that this is usually accomplished um, is in an instrument like this. This is actually a very nice instrument um, where uh, the sample is heated uh, using um, basically an arc furnace with, with four different or three different uh, tips uh, to provide heat uh, to the sample. And then the rest of this apparatus is basically uh, devoted to uh, keeping a clean atmosphere in here and having um, some sort of a pull rod apparatus. So this is beautiful. This is a really nice piece of equipment. But there's one problem with it for someone like me, and that is that it's really expensive. So <laughs> I can't get this. This is not an option. Um, but uh, the induction furnace is well within the grasp of most uh, research groups. The power supply only costs on the order of a couple tens of thousands of dollars, and you can build the rest yourself. Um, you can get a, a pulling mechanism at a fairly low price, although these Centaur ones are very expensive. <laughs> so that's not really the way to go. And you can build the, uh, the growth chamber um, you know, at as low of a price as you can pay an undergraduate. So um, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> advising anything in particular, but, but it's very cheap is the point uh, to build this up. Um, and so just to, to sort of say what we have going on here, I think we've already covered it, um, is that we have this, uh, this quartz uh, tube that's surrounding the sample space. We have purified argon gas passing through the space, no getter. And then we have the RF coil and the, um, in this case, the crucible uh, with the material inside of it, sitting inside of here, and a pull rod. And now I want to just show you this system uh, in action. So this is a time-lapse video, took place actually over several hours, and it's actually not a successful growth, but it's the only good video that I have. Oh, shoot. Let's see. What's it doing? Come on. Let's play that video. OK. So what you can see you know, is that we're, we inserted the pull rod uh, into the melt. We attached some crystal to the tip. We have rotation to help with mixing. And then we just slowly pull it out. It's totally straightforward. Um, and you can see that at the end, I'm losing the laser, but you can see that at the end, um, the crystal separated itself. And it ultimately wasn't a successful growth. But I think this gives the picture of how you can, you know, in a fairly straightforward manner, uh, pull a nice big single crystal out of a melt like this. Yes. So I was going to say this. Um, I have two things to say about this. First of all, the way that we monitor the temperature um, is using a pyrometer. What does this mean in practice? Well, it means that we don't measure the actual temperature because some of the intensity is lost as it goes through the quartz. That assumes that you have a pristine, perfectly clean piece of quartz, right? And in practice, what happens during the growth is that some vapor, almost inevitably, will start to collect uh, on the quartz. And so what you'll see over the course of the growth is that your um, temperature uh, will get lower and lower. Um, and so in practice, what it really means is that you use the pyrometer at the beginning of the growth to help establish the growth conditions, to try to get close to what you believe is the right melting temperature. And then you, you sit at that power and make small variations around it. <laughs> Hmm? Even during the pull. Now, th this is the second comment. I know from experience that with the um, arc furnace Chikrowski, um, a lot of your time is spent um, adjusting the positions of the arcs, how close are they to the bool, you know, all sorts of uh, details uh, of trying to maintain the melt and the meniscus uh, of the crystal as it's being pulled. Um, 
I think this is an advantage of the induction furnace approach because you don't have so many knobs to turn. All that you can do is increase the power or decrease the power. And it couples to the entire thing all at once. So the arc furnace is you know, heating on these discrete points. This thing is uniform. There's nothing to change. Um, so then <clears throat> what will happen during the growth? Well, things will change, right, inevitably, because you're depleting uh, the amount of material that's in here. Um, so you may need to increase or decrease the power a little bit. Uh, you may, despite your best efforts, uh, start to have a buildup of a thin layer of oxide on this thing. Um, that may cause you to have to increase the power on your power supply. You may start to get this crazy thing where the, you know, the, fl the, the melt starts to try to crawl out of the crucible. Um, so all of these things you have to contend with, but, but really your only option uh, for controlling this thing is increasing or decreasing the power. That makes life easier. So do you have any idea how is the temperature profile in the milk? Yeah. Not nothing. We, we, we see from the periphery and the, the temperature is probably the profile. How does it Yeah, so that, that is a good question. There is a temperature gradient. Um, hmm. I, I don't remember off the top of my head, although Kaya recently did some growths, and we can talk about it afterwards. So, yeah. Ah. Uh, do we need to cool the crucible? You don't need to cool the crucible. So what, what I've done here, this is a tungsten crucible. Um, but we've been successful with all of those different sorts of crucibles that I showed. Um, what we've, what we've done, uh, this is a trick. OK, this is important. This thing is actually sitting on top of a pedestal um, that is made out of boron nitride. OK, so this pedestal sort of goes down to the bottom um, of this. So th this isn't a very good representation, but there's, a, there's basically two uh, boron nitride crucibles that are about this big um, that are stacked here. Um, and those actually are sitting on top of a water-cooled uh, copper piece. But I don't think that's really necessary. That's just an artifact of me being extremely cheap and using thrown-away pieces. Um, the reason that we use boron nitride is that um, its thermal expansion uh, profile uh, is very favorable. So in the early days, um, we tried using alumina crucibles. Um, inevitably, um, the, the thermal stresses that you put on it uh, will cause them to shatter, or at least to break. Um, but in, in the process of figuring out how we were going to do this, we learned that boron nitride is, is really excellent. Uh, it doesn't do that. So maybe a stupid question, but can you do a solar with levitating Yes, samples? yes, you can, and that would be wonderful. We haven't made it to that point yet. Yeah, but you certainly could. And, and in fact, people have. I, I want to make the comment that induction furnace methods are something that have been in use since the 1950s, if not before. And from my viewpoint, as a, which is a very limited viewpoint as a physicist, it seems that there was a, a peak in knowledge and use that was sometime around the 60s or 70s. And that since then, at least in our community, the knowledge and use has fallen off tremendously. But in industry, they use this all the time. OK. Can I ask you a question? Yes. <laughs> Do you know what kind of crucible they use in the silicon industry? All silicon? Boy. <laughs> I'll tell you the audience. Right yeah, now. I don't know. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Do you know? Iridium. Yeah. Oh, iridium. I have heard that. Yeah. Do you know how much those cost? <laughs> <laughs> so how many iridium crystals do you have? I have at some total of zero. <laughs> Although I, I suspect that Theo Segrist, who's you know, at the mag lab, has one or two hidden away. I suspect. He's never told me as much. But he has a lot of things that he got from Bell Labs. Um, yeah. OK. Oh, actually, one more just side comment. He told me that back in the old days at Bell Labs, when they had a surplus in their department, and they needed to spend out some money at the end of the year, what they would do is they would say, well, let's just buy you know, a whole bunch of platinum and maybe iridium crucibles and be done with it. So that would be nice, right? <laughs> OK, um, last point here. Uh, I want to illustrate that it is uh, well within uh, your capabilities to grow uh, both uh, metallic samples. That's, that's very easy, um, as well as nonmetals. This is just an example uh, where we've grown a crystal of silicon 
We didn't use an iridium crucible. We used an alumina crucible. Uh, but it makes the point that you know, making a melt in this situation of you know, a variety of different types of materials is really easy. OK, other uses for the RF furnace. Um, one is that it can be used in a Bridgman technique mode. Um, have you guys encountered this so far? A little bit? OK, so what this really amounts to is a situation where you make a crucible, right, and then make sure that it has a sharp point on the end. You load it with polycrystalline material, and then you bring this uh, whole thing um, into the hot zone of a furnace. You know, here this is shown uh, in the context, I think, of a, of a tube furnace, uh, which is fairly typical. But you can imagine doing this just as easily uh, inside of an induction furnace. The idea then um, is to heat the tip of this so that it um, becomes liquid, and then to draw this sample um, through the hot zone slowly. And as you do that, um, this crystal that nucleates first, um, as you draw it you know, out of the hot zone, will solidify and then that grain uh, will propagate back uh, through the sample. This can be very useful, um, for instance, in terms of trying to work with materials that have high vapor pressures, where you really need to keep everything uh, to stay put uh, in the crucible rather than to evaporate away and you no longer have the right stoichiometry. So for instance, um, you can take something like a tantalum uh, tube. This is a terrible example because it's not sharp at the end like this, but it's, it's a, nonetheless an example where you seal it, you get all of your material down in here, uh, suspend it from the alumina pull rod by some refractory metal um, wire, and then you just slowly draw it out uh, of the tube. And you can have some very good success with making uh, large single crystals in this way. OK. And one last comment uh, on induction furnace methods. Oh, Nick. My, my favorite what? Wire. Well, if I'm using a tantalum crucible, I like a tantalum wire. Yeah, although I've used other things. But I don't, I don't like mixing and matching. Huh? Some of these wires can be very brittle. Yeah, some are very brittle. And I also don't like changing, you know, I like to use the wire to be the same as the crucible. Because there's no way that you can have a weird reaction then. You know, you can do all your homework and still miss something. Um, and tantalum is reasonably malleable. Tantalum and niobium are reasonably malleable. Tungsten is a pain. Yeah. <laughs> OK. All right, so one last use uh, for molten metal flux growth, um, or induction furnace, uh, in terms of molten metal flux growth. And I can see that I'm almost out of time. So we won't get to arc furnace, but that's OK. OK. You have uh, five to 10. There's been lots of questions. So OK. So. Um, OK, everyone knows molten metal flux growth now. So I don't need to explain what is that. Um, molten metal flux growth is wonderful. You can grow so many different things with it. So much progress has been made with it. So I am certainly not putting it down or saying that it's not a good thing. But there is one thing that I've always found frustrating about it, and that is that it takes a long time. Right? Normally, you'll do a flux growth over the course of one or two weeks. So there's that. The other thing that is um, sometimes annoying is that you don't actually get to see uh, what's happening in the furnace um, as the growth is, is proceeding. So if you want to try to get around those two sorts of obstacles, uh, you can actually accomplish that um, using uh, this type of apparatus. And I'm going to show you one example here. Um, we recently worked out um, how to grow this compound, uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2, uh, in a molten metal flux. Um, it hadn't been done before. Uh, the growth parameters weren't known. Um, but it turned out that you needed, or you do need, um, fairly high temperatures uh, to get it to form, uh, up around 1,500 degrees C. That was what originally drove us you know, sort of into systems like this. Um, OK, so we, in reality, we worked out this growth uh, process um, in resistive furnaces. But there were some uh, drawbacks. Uh, one thing is that the growth times are long. And that makes a particularly um, sort of un or not nice situation for this. Because over this long growth period, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong, right? Um, so you could run out of, so we would do these growths in tube furnaces where we're flowing argon gas uh, to protect uh, the metal at high temperatures. Uh, you can run out of gas. 
Um, the alumina tube that you're using um, has a bad habit of breaking, and then you'll oxidize your entire sample and you'll have uranium oxide all over the place. That's not good. Um, and, and, and for that matter, uh, what if there's a power outage and, and so on? So there's, there's lots of problems with that. Well, you know, motivated by, by those challenges, what we decided to do uh, was to explore whether or not um, molten metal flux growth could be accomplished uh, using the RF furnace. And the way that we do this is we seal you know, our indium, which is our flux, <coughs> uranium, ruthenium, and silicon uh, inside of these tantalum ampoules. We then suspend them from the alumina pull rod and then um, over the course of, well, we bring it up to temperature and over the course of one maybe at most two days, um, we draw this uh, through the hot zone of the coil. So we're doing this in a mode where we're moving it through the coil. Um, when we started on this, I don't think that we had a strong expectation that we'd be able to make crystals that are comparable to those that are made uh, by the conventional molten metal flux growth. But in fact, it works just as well, uh, and maybe if not better. Um, so we're able uh, from the resistive furnaces to produce crystals like this. Um, they're very high quality. Um, they have large triple R's, so on and so forth. You can get nice Lowy images. Um, and we get it almost exactly the same result um, after one to two days of drawing the, the crucible through the hot zone like this. So I don't know, actually, uh, specifically why this works so well. But there's clearly some advantages. Um, you can see the growth as it's happening. So if the crucible starts to experience some distress, you can turn off the system immediately and not run the risk of contaminating your building with radioactive stuff. Um, I think this is, so one of my other projects has to do with transuranics. We're not actually doing that in my lab in Tallahassee, but in another group, but I think this has a great application uh, to that. Um, and the other obvious advantage is that it's really rapid throughput. You can carry out a growth in a day, reload the system, carry out another growth, so on and so forth. Um, that's extremely useful, uh, especially if you're trying to do a chemical substitution series. Do you use the same temperature, or do you know what the temperature is? It's the same temperature. Yeah, otherwise the growth conditions are exactly the same. Now, if I can speculate, I think that the key aspect of this is the mixing of the melt, which accelerates things. So if I, if I really had to speculate, um, I would imagine that if I could set up a tube furnace where I had a little motor that would turn the ampoule you know, during the growth, which would be nice, right? You can do that. Um, it probably would go fast too. But, but I think this is a nice uh, alternative way to think um, about molten metal flux growth. Nick looks like he has a question. Okay, <laughs> we can talk later. All right, so I... I how, how do you choose the time? Um, you know, why not half a day? I think you probably could. Type eight people. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. I, haven't, I have not explored that question. And, you know, this is a relatively new development in my group, um, so we'd like to answer those questions, but I, I don't know. Why not an hour? I don't know. Maybe an hour is going to work. Question about your picture. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are tantalum tubes that you crunched with that. Ah, I've arc melted them. Ah. So let me get to that. Yeah, <laughs> if I have a few more minutes, I can go through the arc furnace slides a little bit. Okay, so I think that's the end of this induction furnace part, and I hope that I've at least uh, get, grabbed someone's interest uh, in this growth technique. I think it's really fun and really a nice way to grow crystals. Okay, arc furnace. So you guys have all seen this. You know what it does, so I won't dwell uh, on the parts or show you my a nice video of the arc furnace in action, uh, even though I like that video a lot. Um, I want to say a few things about what I think the arc furnace is good for. And probably you've already encountered these tricks. Um, but the first thing that I always think of for arc furnace um, is for preparation of powders and for cleaning materials. And we already touched on this. So remember that powders um, can frequently absorb a lot of moisture uh, from the atmosphere. That's a problem. But with the arc furnace, uh, you can easily uh, fix that up by arcing your powder. And after you do that, you'll often be left with a nice uh, metallic ball like this, and then all of this other scum uh, that's been blasted off of it. That's clearly stuff that you don't want in your growth, right? I don't know what it is, but I don't want it in my growth. So I think this is a very useful way um, to quickly clean your materials. 
Um, I want to make one other comment while I'm here. Um, and that is that for the arc furnace, you probably have already heard this, but you do need to think about the type of element that you're going to be melting. Um, it's probably in your interest to avoid high vapor pressure elements, especially poisonous ones, or ones that like to catch on fire when they're in a powder. Um, in my experience, manganese is also a pain. Um, it's pretty straightforward to arc melt dirty manganese. But once you get it clean and you have a piece of it, if you try to arc melt it again, it likes to burst or shatter or break. So that's a, just a, an observation. If you're going to deal with manganese, watch out for that. Um, okay, arc furnace is also useful for preparation of precursors, for instance, for um, molten metal flux growth. Here's one example in the cobalt to germanium a binary phase diagram. A cobalt maybe is a little bit of a pain because it has a high melting temperature. But you can very easily you know, access um, low melting temperatures uh, in these sorts of situations. You can make any of these melts uh, in an arc furnace. That's a nice starting point uh, for preparing uh, some molten metal flux growths. It's also very useful for introducing um, high melting temperature elements into your melts. So notoriously difficult are um, carbon and boron. They have really high melting temperatures. They're not very friendly for fluxes and all sorts of things. One way that you can deal with that is by looking again into the binary phase diagram. In this case, I show you carbon to cerium, but of course you're not necessarily growing cerium compounds. So just look into your binary phase diagram. But in this example, you can see um, that it's no problem uh, to reach a low melting temperature around uh, this concentration. And the way that you do this in practice in the arc furnace is that you'll want to set up your carbon or boron kind of against the wall of one of your pots and then to take your piece of cerium or whatever and sort of wedge it against it. Because the carbon and boron are so light that you know, the plume itself will like to sort of push them away. And what you do is you gently bring the plume in you know, from the side that's close to the cerium, uh, get the cerium to melt, and then as that melt front sort of goes towards the carbon or boron, um, it'll, the carbon and boron will sort of jump into the melt, and then you'll have captured it. And now you have a nice uh, intermetallic you know, piece of material that you can handle, you can you know, use as a flux, whatever. Now you've got carbon and boron uh, in your melt. Okay. I'm going to skip this, and I'm going to make, this is my last slide, and this is just responding to how do you deal with the tantalum and niobium uh, to make crucibles. So um, one way that you can buy tantalum and niobium is in the form of these tubes. There's lots of companies that make these. You can buy high quality, high purity uh, tubes like this, but that doesn't make a very good crucible. So. If you want to make a good crucible, it's very straightforward, but you have to be a little bit meticulous about some things. Um, all that you really need to do is to cut off a piece of this using um, a pipe cutter, then to crimp the, crimp the end of it like this, maybe using a vise. And don't be shy, you know, crimp it hard. Um, and then make these types of folds. I make these using the vise as well. I sort of you know, wedge it in there and then uh, fold it up. This is really important because um, tantalum itself does not end niobium, although niobium is a little easier, um, doesn't like to wet to itself. So when you put an arc on it, it'll bead up, but the bead will sort of you know, pull onto itself. And so the only way that you're going to get the end of this to really seal is if when that bead forms, it flows down. So it needs to flow down into that crack. If it doesn't flow down there, you're not going to get a sealed ampoule. Maybe takes a few tries, but it, this is a pretty straightforward way to do this. Okay, so you arc melt it. You now have one side uh, sealed. You can go ahead and load your elements in there. Another point of advice, if you're dealing with elements that maybe uh, melt very easily, like your flux, or maybe they're very reactive, like some, I don't know, calcium or something, stuff those ones down on this end. Right? Just stuff them in there and then put the other higher melting temperature stuff on this end. Because your next step is going to be to crimp and fold and arc melt. This side's going to get hot. You don't want those things to come spraying out the end, which they definitely will do if you put them on this end. So, and this, this is a really great strategy because now you can take this thing, 
you know, put it on your copper hearth. You don't have to bolt it down or anything like that. You just put it on your copper hearth. You bring the arc in here. The system does get hot, but as these things try to escape, they run into this other stuff and they stop there and they react with it. And now you don't have this melting temperature problem anymore. Um, at that point, you have a nice sealed thing. I don't know why we put it in a quartz tube, but we did. Um, and, and you're ready to go. All right. Um, so that, that brings me to the end. I don't really need to talk about this, but I want to make one last comment. Um, one of the, I guess, grandfathers or great-grandfathers of our field uh, was Bernd Matthias. He was um, a prolific crystal grower. And I've been told that he used to say something like this. I don't exactly know what it means, but <laughs> even a blind chicken can find a grain. And I think that that's very optimistic for people like us. I take it to mean that in crystal growth, you have so many options that really all you need to do is get out there and start uh, trying some different things. Inevitably, you're going to do something uh, that is worth studying. And last, I'll just acknowledge um, collaborators. And I don't think this is a complete list, so I apologize if I didn't include someone that I should have. Okay, thank you. <laughs>